Good evening, and I want to welcome you to our final summer program for the Egg Harbor Historical Society. We have a nice group tonight. We have a very special program tonight. Uh, the Herman Bernstein story, the family story, and uh, his enterprises, and all the things that happened. We not only are going to learn about Herman and his family and his friends, but also we'll get to see Egg Harbor the way it was for his, for his lifespan from 1902 to 1965. He was, a, as we'll find out, a businessman in Egg Harbor for 40 years. And we managed to save an icon, and that's the gas station that he produced downtown. We have tonight to produce the program. We have uh, Eileen Bernstein Roberts, who do the narration for us. That's the niece of Herman's. And then we have, at, we look at the, all the back of the heads, that's okay. We have Elvin, Elvin Bernstein. Elvin is the uh, my nephew, yeah, step. There we go, there's Elvin. And we have the village historian and also a friend of the family, Pete Lemire. Pete grew up right downtown where everything else happened in Meg Harbor. <laughs> Our sponsors for our summer programs are on the screen, Dave and Bonnie Colson, Dawn and Jerome McGinnis, Clark Bourne, and Vic Victoria Stewart, and Carol Shipley. They uh, sponsored, uh, contributed to sponsoring the programs for this summer. Actually, it was for last year, but it was, everything was canceled because of COVID, so we carried it over to this summer. As we go through the program, Eileen will give us some background on Elvin, and we will see some slides. I'll forward the slides. I'm Herman, excuse me. Elvin's over here. I'm Herman, thank you. That's why I got you in front here, Judy. Keep me up. And when it's time to turn it, come up, push this button here. Okay. So uh, we'll have some slides and then we'll advance on and we'll make comments, Elvin and Pete and Eileen, about slides. You can either keep it in the back of your mind if you see something that really should be said about the slide that you might know, or I guess we're open enough that you can just shout out and tell us all about what you know about that slide. There are people on here we do not know who they are. You might know them and maybe let us know at that time or later. We'd appreciate that. I will try to adjust the volume so once we get going with Eileen, we will continue then on right through the program. One last thing I want to mention, those of you that are familiar with the historical society programs, it's just unbelievable how soon this place is cleaned up when that last bell rings. That's so if you're an, a, a, an able person, an adult, male or female, if you could help us with the chairs, it sure helps a lot. Otherwise, Pete and I have to do that tomorrow at 7 in the morning. The carts are back there. You said 9.30. I said 9.30. <laughs> okay. So, with that, with that, Eileen, you want to get us started with uh, the Herman Bernstein story. I would love to do that. And it's so nice to see everybody here tonight. So, as... as uh, get, are we okay for volume, I hope? As gets... Lower? Uh, I don't think we got a person going higher. I have two hearing aids. I go for higher. Sorry. Okay. Already? It's nice to see everybody here. And as Giz had said, please feel free to interject if you recognize people or if you have some comments or if you remember Uncle Herman that you'd like to, to tell us about. But Herman Bernstein, my Uncle Herman, was born in the township of Jacksonport, August 20th, 1902. He was one of 10 children born to Carl and Eliza Bernshine, who were progressive farmers in West Jacksonport. He attended the Washington School, located on the corner of Ehlers Road and County Road I, where he graduated from the eighth grade. After grade school, he helped his parents on the farm. This is my grandma and grandpa Bernshine, Uncle Herman's mom and dad. Um, I don't, I, I have very faint memories of him. Um, I remember going to the home um, when he was dying and my dad sitting on his bed. Um, at that time, he had a big white 
bushy beard like Al has tonight, only I think Grandpa's was longer than yours, Al. <laughs> and, and I remember that they said that Grandma Bernstein was a large woman, but she had very tiny feet. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but that's what I have. Uh, him being my grandpa, I, I don't remember. I was probably a little baby. I was born in 1940, so I very don't really remember him. Uh, grandma, I remember her a little bit, very vaguely. Uh, you have to understand, my memory doesn't carry me quite back that far, but I do remember being with her as a little, little, pretty little tyke. I don't know how big I was, probably a year or two years old. Uh, that's all I know about her. And these are the three boys. Um, that's Uncle Bill on the left, Uncle Herman in the middle, and Bruno on the right. And Bruno was my dad. And there they are as um, older gentlemen. Um, that's Uncle Herman on the left, my dad in the middle, and then Uncle Emil on the right. And this is um, their sister, Annie. Um, the talk about her when she died, I think like about 18 or 19 years old, she had gone to a baseball game in Kiwani and was hit by the baseball um, and died shortly after she had been to the baseball game. And they had always said that um, she died as a result from that injury. She was very pretty. I just want to interject that we do have that story in the Bernstein book, which you see over here, it was in the newspaper, that baseball accident and things that came after that amongst the teams uh, in that game. So this is recorded in the Door County newspapers, which is in the booklet that's over on the table. And then this is um, the uh, five brothers that survived to live a, a ripe old age, I would say. Um, this was taken about 1957 when Uncle Charlie on the right um, came home from California and it was, I think it was December of 1957. Again, it's Uncle Herman on the left, my dad, Uncle Amo in the middle, and then Uncle Bill with the glasses, and then Uncle Charlie. Um, Uncle Herman had the Chevrolet garage. My dad was a farmer. Uncle Amo was a farmer. Um, Uncle Bill had a welding shop in Sheboygan. And then Uncle Charlie was out in California and he, he had cottages. He rented out cottages. I remember one time when my husband and I were coming home from the service, um, we went down to visit Uncle Charlie and we, he took us down to see the Rose Bowl. Oh my God, that man drove fast. I was scared to death. But he was fun to be with. Uncle Charlie started a garage in Egg Harbor, and Uncle Herman went to work for him for several years. In 1925, he started a tire shop on the opposite side of the road in Egg Harbor on County Trunk Line 17. In 1927, Uncle Charlie decided to sell his business, and Herman bought him out. Business was slow at that time when he decided to take over the agency for Chevrolet cars. For many years, he provided record service for all of the all of Northern Door County. Do you, um, Pete, do you want to just talk about that a little bit? Female, he always had record service, and I didn't always see them go out or see them come back. But I don't recall a single time that I did not see Herman at the controls. Most of the time, I believe that Herman himself answered the record calls. And this is his wrecker and a tractor that he's hauling. The building you're looking at is now the chocolate chicken. It burned into a hundred a little later. That's a 
and this is also at the gas station. This is Uncle Charlie's son, um, Lawrence, and Uncle Bill's son, a daughter, Marcine. Giz likes the raccoon. <laughs> this pet raccoon. Every kid in Egg Harbor at that time had a pet raccoon, I think. <laughs> no, not really, but. Charlie had a little history coming up here. Charlie's son. And this is Uncle Charlie and his son, Lawrence. For those that saw him before, Lawrence died at Pearl Harbor. So if you're looking at the photo, probably not too long after this. We don't have the exact date. But Lawrence was killed at Pearl Harbor during the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uncle Herman thought the winter months were slow and dull in Dark County. So during the winter months, he would go to Milwaukee and find employment there, anxious to acquire as much education and knowledge as he could. Uncle Herman attended night school and work days. And this is a picture that we kind of imagine might have been that same time frame. In 1931, Collie Thayer, a friend of Uncle Herman, encouraged him to build a modern garage structure in the very same spot his garage and sales room stood. It would be of old English style and one of the most attractive in the state. This building would be 100 feet by 50 feet and modern in every respect. There was a beautiful sales and display room, stock room, tire repair shop, and gasoline station. And uh, Pete, you have a little bit of information on Cully. Yeah, thanks to Gibbs' research, uh, he went through the advocate and they found an obituary for a C.E. Thayer, and Herman attended, was a pallbearer, and Mr. Thayer was the regional manager for the Standard Oil Distribution Center in Sturgeon Bay. <laughs> now, if you remember that first photo, there were a couple of old pumps there. We're assuming Herman was selling Standard in the old garage, and Mr. Thayer convinced him to build the modern stone building we see downtown now. And that's just another picture of the garage. Um, also, Pete, I'm going to call on you again because you have memories of the gas station that says Baraboo Service and that white building. Can you just kind of give us a little bit about that, please? Uh, that building was... Uh, owned by a company called Barnstall Oil. They kind of disappeared from Door County, but they were rather prominent in the 30s. They had a distribution center out of Sturgeon Bay. They had trucks that delivered gasoline. And a uh, person by the name of, and Bill will remember this, Lawrence Barber moved that station from Sturgeon Bay to Egg Harbor in, I think, 1937? 36. 36. And he operated for a time as uh, Barnstall, and I think it went to, looking at the Hain girls here, it went to Sinclair. And then when your parents bought it, they went to Mobile. It was Sinclair for, for a few years until my Uncle Shorty started working for Mobile, and then it became Mobile. <laughs> That's the history on the building you see there of Baraboo Super Service. Most of you remember that as uh, Harvey Haynes Gas Station, where the park is now located north edge of Village, Harborview Park. That was moved from Sturgeon Bay, where the Ace Hardware is now located. In 1936, and Judy and all of her brothers and sisters grew up there. My dad bought it in 1942. In 1942, yes. And that's Uncle Herman. He always had a dog with him. <laughs> so we thought that was kind of a cute picture. A, an interesting thing is all of these pictures that you're seeing tonight um, came out of Uncle Herman's original photograph album. If you want to play his story, you can take this picture where you're sitting, according to what I just said, or, or, or Pete just said. The gas station was moved <coughs> from Sturgeon Bay in 1936. Mm -hmm. He built his station in 1931. <coughs> So there you've got this film, this is the picture dated between 30, probably around 33, 34, before the gas station 35. 
And Bill, do you remember the Wilson store? No, other than that, I remember the going next door. Okay. And uh, oh, the guy that lived in it that was kind of a local whatever. Mm -hmm. And we used to chew the grass in front of his uh, sermon. <laughs> Is that the one, uh, Pete, where you thought that? Tell us about that picture. <laughs> Alvin, you can tell us what our agreement was on the model of that truck. That's an old diamond T truck. And it looks to be like a gas truck. Like, if it looks to what we're looking at, it's hard to tell. We tried to decipher it the other day when we were down here. But I did come up and it's an old diamond T, probably from the 30s, early 30s. Besides servicing cars, he sold Standard Oil products, Chevrolet cars and trucks, Caterpillars, tires, Kellogg and King radios, electric refrigerators, lawnmowers, bicycles, candy bars, and Cracker Jacks. And I remember the Cracker Jacks because when we went to Uncle Herman's with my dad, we always came back with the Cracker Jacks. And if we didn't go with my dad, he always brought us a box of Cracker Jacks. So I remember the Cracker Jacks. How much were they back then? I didn't have to pay for them, so I don't really know, but they were good. Modern concrete roads were built in the county. Traffic increased, and so did his business. And those are just some vehicles and, and his garage. And those are the tires that um, he had. We decided they were wrapped in paper or something, right, to protect them from shipping. The gentleman on this picture we do not recognize, but we're assuming that it's some of his mechanics. And that's another picture of the tires. And notice the gas pumps on the on the left, kind of like what we not like what we have now. Can you back it up this? Yes, I can. Can I go back to the tires? Just a little history on those tires. You see those big diamond tires, probably road grader tires. When I was a little kid, we seen the tires on the tire pile behind the garage. We used to go back there and play it. And I asked my dad, I said, how come all the old road grader tires are there? Well, he says, Son, your uncle sells all the tires to the county highway department. They need a tire to have come to him. Yeah. Maybe Bill might remember some of that, but I, I remember my dad telling me that that those, those all those tires were were uh, sold to the county. Those big tires like that. But there was no farmer would have a tire that big back that old. Right. So they were sold for like road graders or big trucks. Those are the caterpillars that he sold. And this was an ad that is found in the Door County Advocate um, advertising his radios. And those are the lawnmowers. Um, and you can just see the bicycle on the left hand side. And Pete, you had an interesting comment about those lawnmowers. The first power mowers that I remember, and Bill, you might remember farther back, they were actually powered by a small gasoline engine. But as you can see, they were mounted on real mowers, the old push, yeah. hand push real mower. And I don't know when the rotary mowers came out, but the first power ones that I remember were like the ones you see there. With the new attractive garage, valuable and prompt service given by his mechanics, Wallace Leinbach, Joseph Gagnon, Lee Adams, Arnold Fairchild, and, um, and Al Stray. Uncle Herman made many friends through the years, brought more business to him by their recommendations. His station was a peop where people would gather to tell fish stories 
and have pictures taken to prove their stories. And there you can see there's quite a few people. And again, you know, we don't know who they were. Nothing was written on the back of the pic pictures. I wish I could. Uh, the gentleman that uh, he's pointing the arrow to shows up on all kinds of pictures. He always was well dressed with a suit and hat on, but unfortunately, we do not know who he is. So, <laughs> Bill, got any clues? You ever remember oh, seeing him around? And again, you can see those fancy gas pumps with their crowns. <laughs> stone rock of various colors and I believe this was taken down in 1988 Charlene is that right 83 83 well if you finish the three it looks like an eight <laughs> <laughs> and there's another picture of his record And again, we're assuming that that is his, him, Uncle Herman with his mechanics. He's the one that has his, is leaning up against the Goodyear tire sign. I don't know who these gentlemen are either. <laughs> it would have been really fun to have been able to know who they are, but. Does anyone know who these two fellows are? We've been looking at for them for a couple years. <laughs> and these are the fish that people caught, and I'm assuming bringing them up to Uncle Herman to show them. Yeah, they really did catch all those fish. In 1947, a fire destroyed the garage that he had refurnished and modernized after he had purchased it from Uncle Charlie. It was estimated a fire loss of $75,000, and for a time they thought it would wipe out the entire village. In the building at that time, there were several vehicles, a large stock of merchandise, and a lot of equipment. Herman needed this building as he used it for storage, and he did the repair work there. Hardly had the ashes stopped smoldering than Herman began to erect a more permanent building to accommodate the large business he had built. Now this lot accommodates the chocolate chicken and the Harbor View Grill. And those are pictures of the fire burning. After you go down and take a look at the north side of the chocolate chicken, you will see what I'm outlining here. Those bricks are still there. And when they rebuilt, they just filled this in here with more up-to-date. Mm -hmm. So part of this building is still there, next to the Village Harbor View Park. Mm -hmm. another shot of the fire. In front of this structure were, origi were the original gasoline pumps. Of course, the original ones were the old-style hand pump, now modernized. His pumps were the latest type, and in normal year, they would pump 100,000 gallons of gasoline. This is dated at about 1939. How do you date things when you're an amateur historian? You find out that that lady there is your grandmother, <laughs> that is your older sister, and we guess she's five, and you do your math. How old is uh, you know, she's five years old, and you come up with the date of 1939 for this photo. Compared to just a few years later, Uncle Herman would sell about 50 or more Chevrolet cars a year, and his mechanics would service hundreds of cars. Esther Warchek operated the office. And we kind of figured out that he was great in advertising because there's tons of ads that Giz found in the Door County Advocate. 
And Giz, you had a date on that, didn't you, from what the first one was to the last one? As you see in the upper left hand corner, the first date that we found in the newspaper as far as advertising, 1926 for automobiles. And you can see the prices and you see the photo of the automobile. One of his last ones was 1965. So that's the span of basically his 40 years in business selling automobiles out of downtown Egg Harbor. And that is a, a truck or a semi, whatever you want to call it back then, bringing a load of new cars. What has he got on there? Three, four, four. And this is Uncle Herman receiving an award for, from the Chevrolet people. And that's Esther. He was his bookkeeper, and he later married her. How would want to go back? Grover Stapleton? I don't know. Looks like him. Yeah. Look like him. Yeah. He become judge, I think, Judge Stapleton. Yeah. He, was a, he was an attorney. Yeah, I know the name. Yeah. Looks like him. What was the name? Stapleton. Grover Stapleton. Okay. I think he become a judge, if I'm not mistaken. Bill, would that be right? Or did he become a judge, but I'm not sure. It's Grover. Yeah. Oh, I don't think that's him. Back to Esther. Okay, this is a picture of Chief Oshkosh. Uncle Herman um, was a great friend of, of um, Roy Oshkosh, and Al has some stories to tell about Chief Oshkosh and Uncle Herman. Yeah, he was, he was a, out to the farm. Herman would bring him out to the farm, and he'd come out there by himself. He would lose. Uh, I was probably in high school then already when they would come out there, out there quite a bit. And uh, my sister actually become one of the little dancers that he would have when he put on his his uh, shows over there at the, at the place. Uh, very very wonderful man. Uh, very knowledgeable. And a lot of people didn't think that he was the chief, but he was the last chief of the the Ashkosh Menominee Indians. Indians. Yeah. Yep, he was the last one. And I remember her very well. And uh, I don't know what's over at the place now, but when he had it, you could go down in the basement. The basement floor was bedrock, smooth as this floor. Mm -hmm. Solid bedrock. You can see where the glacier slid from the south or the west to the north, to the southeast, just this direction, from the, the bedrock down there. You wouldn't think that that was. There with all the rock and all there, but that's where it was. Smooth as glass. And then this is um, a fish boil, um, and Pete and, and or Al will talk about Uncle Herman and his fish boils. He was very famous, or known very, very well known for um, his fish boils, and he put on many, many, many fish boils. So, Pete and Al? So the information that I kind of came up with, looking back, that he was probably one of the first ones, how he got into the fish boiling business, I really don't know, but he was supposedly one of the first ones to start a fish boil here in York County. You know, and that's all I know about it, but he did an awful lot of fish boils. When I got a little older, I was one of them that helped clean up the kettles. <laughs> uh, just to add to that a little bit, uh, picking up on Giz's research, there's an article in the book that Giz put together that I don't know the year, but he and Frank Ames, who was the son of Dr. Ames, and some of you know had a restaurant in Sturgeon Bay, they served fish to approximately 400 people that came to Door County from the Cleveland Chamber of Commerce. So he, had small guest groups, 
and he had huge guest groups. He served for the Farm Bureau. He served at his church over at Dyer at West Jacksonport. I have fond memories of the annual fish boil that Herman would put on for the baseball team. I don't know if you remember, Bill, but your dad and Uncle John posted it down at the clubhouse one or two years. But every year after the season was over, if we won two games or ten or none, Herman put on a fish boil and beer and treated the ball team. Off time it was in the little yard behind the garage. So. He boiled a lot of fish in his lifetime, I'll tell you that. He, he, he always put on uh, a fish boil for the Door Valley Highway Department. Uh, he was very good friends with Russ Beery, the Highway Commissioner, back when I was a young fellow. And I remember him putting on fish boils for the Highway Department, all the workers. They'd have an afternoon or whatever it was, they'd take off and they'd have the fish boil. And he'd do that just behind the garage then or something? Where, where did he usually do these? He would go to, at that time the highway shop was on 14th Avenue. So he'd go down there, but when he did them up here, where did he do them? Well, the, the one was down by the Well Diamond. Uh, some of the smaller ones, I don't know this place, but uh, he was acquainted with a number of people that had summer homes down on Point Beach. Oh, and they would have a boil right in their backyard. Oh, okay. uh, the huge boil for Sturgeon Bay was uh, at Martin Park, which I believe now is what they call Sunset down by the shipyard. And, uh, I don't know if we can see that article. It's in Giz's Burntine History Book here. I don't ever remember a fish boil by the garage. I when think he, after he had built his house down on, on the point, he always had fish boils down there, out on, next to the water by the dock. That's where he had a lot of them. But in the other days, I don't remember. Like this, I don't remember this stuff. Do you think that this uh, picture that's up there now is uh, at Zion Lutheran Church? I mean, you think it's at Zion Lutheran? Anybody know the history of Zion? That wouldn't be familiar I, I, to me. Just but looks but like uh, the South like Andy Zion. It could be that little it's social building. Could be. It could be. Okay. Uncle Herman was opportunity to attend Packer games and tell of their greatness and the wonderful team that we would have the next year. This is also a picture that I took out of Uncle Herman's album. He had those pictures just glued in really good. So when I took them out of the album, of course, a lot of the black paper um, came along with it. This postcard was written and sent to Uncle, well, it was sent to Uncle Herman. I think that it was sent to him by Gene Roncini, who was the coach at that time. I could figure out the date, and it was 1952. Some of the Packers' names I could recognize um, by looking at a roster from that time period and recognizing their numbers. But, um, and I'm assuming some of these people are in the frontier were line coaches. But he was a great Packer fan and he truly believed in that team, like we do today. <laughs> I looked this up, the record of this team was six and six. Those were the days when they played 12 games instead of 17 and took you into February. <laughs> they were maybe done by Thanksgiving. Uh, there was COVID Road. Some of these people actually played for Lombardi. Here's Dave Hanner, and uh, one of my favorite is Bobby Dillon, number 44, if you can find him there. He, he was a one-eyed defensive back, right there he is. One of the top ones. I just barely remember these from my early, you know, from the 50s. This is 52, but you can see how things have changed. This picture was taken at Green Bay East High School that's where the Packers played behind the high school in the 1950s. But it did seat around 18,000. This, this set of wooden bleachers went all the way around. And uh, you can see how things have changed in the days of the, the 1950s. There were three Afro-American ball players. That's changed a lot. It's, 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 it's all things have changed in society. But, uh, for a young kids like myself, you know, just like Herman was older, but we still had an idea of what was going on. And as Eileen said, the back of the postcard appeared to say, thank you, Herman, for your telegraph. Maybe Herman had sent uh, 
coach a telegraph, wishing for him to win <coughs> seven games instead of six. So that's an interesting, one other fact I found in that book when I did research, to see, uh, Herman was involved in a lot of sporting things, but the one weekend he went to the Badger game on Saturday, then they trucked over to Chicago for the Chicago Bear and Packer game. <laughs> Another thing he did was uh, with John Bertrager and some of the other people in this area that were into winter sports at this time, they start, tried to develop a winter sports area up to the park. They did have a ski jump and other things going on there. And the story in 1938 was that Herman and, these, and John and these, they had invited the 1938 skating team, the Olympic skating team, to put on an exhibition. Problem was, in 1938, there was no ice. <laughs> so, and there were no indoor ice rinks. So, but they made the, the gesture anyhow and had invited the Olympic skating team. So he was involved in a lot of different things. It's important to that being one of those. Anything else on the Packers? Uncle Herman sold his garage in 1965. January 11th, 1966, he passed away. This is one of the older pictures. That's okay. These are pictures that, you know, were taken in his later years. Um, that's him again. Yeah, he was 64. He was not a well. He was not a well man. He had diabetes, and he just really didn't take care of himself. So he had a lot of, a lot of complications later in life. You don't remember him? Oh yeah, I remember him. I didn't remember when he died. Oh. Uh, I was out of the Harbor by that time. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. 1966. And then there's that one of him. With his, I mean, he always wore this hat, and you always knew that that was Uncle Herman with his. What did, you, what kind of a hat did you call that, Pete? I don't know, bus driver hat. Yeah. Military hat. It has a. Yeah, he had, it, that hat had many names. It, the album up there, emblem up there, is a Standard Oil emblem. So, great guy. Um, and now Pete and Al have. Um, some more comments about Uncle Herman, of things that he did socially, academically, and for the community, so. I didn't tell you anything you want to toss in here? Well, back when they showed the caterpillar tractors, we, I tried to come up with something, and I don't ever remember seeing tractors for sale down here. He did have a little, Caterpillar 15. We would use it out on the farm when it was wet. We'd pull logs out. When they dug the, the, the lagoon down where the condominiums are down on White Cliff Road, they used it down there to pull logs out of the woods and stuff. And whatever happened to it, I don't know. I don't ever remember him selling caterpillars, probably before my time. But I'm thinking that he would have been good friends with the Breggers. The brothers at that time had a cottage that far from down here on Point Beach, or down below the bluff before the skating rink, or before the beach. He might have been good friends and he sold tractors for them. To be a caterpillar dealer uh, took a little doing, I would think, but he may have sold for them. They might have brought him up here for him to sell. I, and I don't know, I'm just guessing. He was friends with a lot of these people uh, all the way around. If you ever remember the name James's, Jerry James and Edward James, Kenny James, they got the uh, household run. And he was very good friends with them. My dad was good friends with the family. I, was, I used to cut grass from the James's, the Schwartons, yeah. And uh, yeah, very, very nice people. Herman was friends with all of those people. So we can see that Herman was a very astute business person for the 40 years he was in business. But I think we'd be remiss if we didn't share at least a little bit of the countless civic and community activities that their uncle Herman was involved in. Giz has mentioned a few, and I'm going to rattle these off quickly.
just to give you some idea of the scope that Herman was involved in here in his 40 years in Egg Harbor. He used the gas station to collect taxes for the town of Egg Harbor, <laughs> sold hunting licenses at the gas station. He was a member of the Door County Civil Defense Group during World War II. He was kind of a leader of the so-called home air raid wardens. He was very supportive of the opening of the Peninsula Players and Giz found some research that Mrs. Rathbone actually credited Herman with not only verbal support but provided some money when they started off back in the early 1930s. I think 35 was the first year Peninsula Players were in business. He organized the Lions Club at Egg Harbor and we have a helper here in the front row, Phil Birchinger, that was in on that positive move. He was a secretary and treasurer for the original Northern Door County Baseball League, which uh, turned into the Door County League that we see now. He was also very instrumental in a key group that had the Egg Harbor franchise transferred from Carl Demean, who was the sole owner, to the Egg Harbor Men's Club and moving the ball diamond from the old fire station location on Harbor School Road to the present location. He uh, was a supporter of winter sports, as Giz said. He was a director from Egg Harbor for the Door County Conservation Club. He was in charge of the fireworks for Egg Harbor in the old days when they shot him off from the old town dock, <laughs> northwest corner of the dock. Kids would be down there wanting to see what he was doing, and he was always friendly when he hung around at the station, but setting up fireworks was, get the you-know-what out of here, kids. <laughs> but Herman, Herman ran the show in the 4th of July fireworks for years. He, we already said he provided record service. His station was a Lake and View bus stop. After he died, he was honored by the Egg Harbor Lot Club in a race featuring the Herman Bernstein Memorial Trophy. He served as a town of Egg Harbor constable. He was involved in the Door County group that came up with ideas how to promote scrap and salvage and how to handle it and get it to where it needed to be during World War II. He was a Chamber of Commerce director, a vice president, and a president. And he also was pretty foresighted. Uh, anybody that's familiar with Egg Harbor knows where Anchorage Cove, I believe it's Anchor Cove or Anchorage <laughs> Cove condos. Herman bought, uh, was it 100 or 150 acres 150, down there, Al? 150 acres he owned all along the shoreline and all the way up, in, in, uh, including the land where I, a friend of mine here, Judy Ortiz, that was all owned by Herman, the whole thing. Uh -huh. yeah, his, his plan was, I believe, to eventually develop and sell lots, which you know was 50, 60 years ahead of his time. He annoyed the kids in Egg Harbor because we used to walk all the way to Judgeville on the beach and when Herman cut the lagoon in and the slit going out to the water, we had to come up and walk all the way as properly in the woods and then go back to the mosquito woods and get on the shore to get to Judgeville. So, um, with that said, uh, I think we've given you an idea of how involved this gentleman was and what an important part he played in the history of Egg Harbor. And maybe in closing, we should also mention any of us that did business with Herman. I bought a 46 Chev, 51, 58, 63. Esther was the ultimate professional. <laughs> Everything was done to perfection by Esther. And she was also quite involved in the community, I think, in the women's club and the garden club. It could be, yeah. yeah so. so that's our story of Herman Bernstein. contributions but you know want to just apologize for the audio <coughs> but those things seem to happen one of our programs the old video went out but it's being recorded by Laddie and uh, Laddie can you get this on on uh, the Sebastopol town uh, yeah we'll put it on the uh, Sebastopol cable channel anybody that has charter uh, TV yeah You'll see it. I'll, I'll probably have it up by uh, Friday night, and it'll be repeated several times next week. Okay, and you know what happened? There won't be any squealing noise in the back. Well, I'll, I'll try to cut most of that out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have this recorded, and we'll try to get some copies here. For those of you that are familiar with the History Center, 
We do have some of our programs on the computer monitor down there where you can sit and watch and read uh, these programs. I can put it on YouTube also. It'll be okay. up there in a few days. That would be great. If anybody wants a card of mine so they have the address, just see me afterwards. Yeah. And uh, as a retired teacher, things like this happen. Audio goes out, video goes out. Somehow we always be able to struggle through. Someday we'll get it all together, but maybe if we went to about a year and a half of COVID interruption, we wouldn't have the trouble we have. But we want to thank uh, Alvin and uh, Eileen. We have a little gift for them. I bet you, Alvin, you want to go home and read all about the history of Lake Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> or, you want to, or you want to see some really great Door County stories which involve a lot of Lake uh, uh, Harbor things. And Eileen, for your work, and uh, working with you and having fun doing it, we have a book for you too to read for Lake Harbor. And a gift certificate also. Well, we, uh, we sure are glad that you were able to present the program for us. And again, this is our final summer series. We'll be looking for something in the future. If you are not on our email list and want to get email copies sent out, make sure you, I uh, think we're passing around the yellow sheet, you can put down your email address on that. But again, it was a fine program. I want to thank the uh, folks for helping us out, Helen, Chief, and Eileen. And thank you for coming. One last thing. Do any of you have a Herman story to tell us? This can be dangerous sometimes asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll leave Herman in, uh, in good standing. And we do have some things over here to look at. And you're, you're free to browse around and, and discuss things. And if some of you fellows can help us and share us, we would appreciate it. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you one on Herman. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why. I, okay, I went over to Herman's house on a couple occasions because I was building a house, and he used. Uh, oh my God! I can't think so well now that you can't come up with it. Anyhow, I used to say carpenter. He had established the uh, water level so we wouldn't have water in his basement. So I cheated. I took extra foot, extra foot, and I paid for that. But I was one occasion I went over. And he was really distraught because Julie liked this, but some of, some of the hand kids had busted some windows in the car and hang turned the shop. <laughs> <laughs> and he was irate. And I had no idea where he was going to go with this. And I said, Herman, Herman, you're kids. I said, you were a kid. I was a kid. Kids do these things. You know, don't... Uh, We'll try to get him in jail for that. That's the kid's thing. I said, uh, you know about that 10, 15 years from now, those kids, maybe one will be a doctor and one will be an attorney. You'll be damn glad you didn't do something. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a hand case, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so you straight out there that he should go easy on the kids because someday he's going to meet him as a lawyer. Or a doctor, right? <laughs> well, I want to thank you for coming. And uh, if you need an elevator, it's down at the end of this hall and the stairways here. And uh, we will have a future programs. So keep an eye on the calls. Keep an eye on the email. That's it for the evening. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs>